Our reading today comes from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, and it's page 1014 in the chair Bibles. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church family. Unfortunately, I'm still on the stool, but recovery's coming along. I'll be standing to preach in no time. It's good to see you all. My name's Josh. I'm one of the pastors here, and if I haven't had the chance to meet you, I'd love to after service. Please come introduce yourself, and I can help you get plugged in here, answer any questions you have about the church, introduce you to other leaders. Uh, Would you pray with me before we jump in? Jesus, our hope is only in you. You are our boast, you are our rock, our redeemer. You lead us through the darkest valley, you never leave us nor forsake us, and we cling to you. So we ask, God, that you would point us to Jesus this morning. May we recognize who he is for us, what he's done for us, and may you be honored and glorified in the gathering of your people this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we kicked off a three-week series we're calling our core devotions, where we want to spend some time and and really think through what we believe God has called us to as a church and as a people to devote ourselves to. Last week, we looked at our first and most important devotion, knowing God through the gospel. And, And we say this is the first and most important in that it's the engine that drives all of our other devotions. It's this devotion of knowing God through the gospel that sits over and above and is the power behind our other devotions. So this week, we're gonna be looking at what it means to be devoted to growing together in our faith. And then next week, we'll see what it means to be devoted to go on mission to the places we live, work, learn, and play, reflecting the God that we know, telling others about Jesus. I want to just remind us again, very clearly, these core devotions, know, grow, and go, are not clever taglines that that we as the pastors came up with in this synergistic, energetic pastors meeting. Throughout the pages of scripture, we see a people who know God, and they have the gospel pulsing through their veins. And because of that, We see them growing together in intimate community and a manifestation of this people in community, growing in their faith together, knowing God through the gospel is to go into the places they live, work, learn, and play, telling others about Jesus. And so growing together in our faith this week. Said another way, we wanna be devoted to intimate biblical community where we believe God uses his people to grow us and shape us into who we already are in Christ. It's in this community of God's people that we grow together in our faith. Now, as I preach on this idea of growing together in community today, I am aware that we find ourselves in what many consider the most individualistic, autonomous culture our world has ever seen. I believe that the prevailing view in our culture, and even for many of us in the church, is that the core of who we are as Americans is this individualism. 
I'm my own person. I don't belong to anyone else. And as we seek to live our lives, we're in this juggling act, of trying to keep all the different responsibilities and commitments we have up in the air. I imagine you might feel this pressure I'm about to explain. We, we have to juggle our work commitments and our family commitments and our church commitments and our social commitments and our kids' social commitments. And all of these are like different plates I'm constantly trying to juggle and keep in the air without dropping any. And I'm not very good at it, right? But life is this crazy juggling act. Does anyone else feel that today? And so rather than try to convince us that growing together in community is another thing we need to do, that it's another plate we have to to add to our already crazily juggling act. My goal this morning is to open the scriptures and allow God to paint this picture that community is not another thing for us to do, but rather it is who we are as God's people. Growing together in community is rooted and built upon knowing God through the gospel. And so we're gonna let God through his word paint a picture of the beauty and the hope and the promise that is ours when growing together in community is not something that we do, but we recognize it's who we are. So let's do that. If you have your Bibles with you, turn them to 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. You just heard it read a moment ago. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. We've got to do a little context work really quickly. 1 Peter was a letter, letter written to the dispersed church throughout Asia Minor. Do you remember in our Luke series, Jesus foretold this day when mass persecution and judgment was going to come on Jerusalem, Peter's writing to those Christians who got out of town, right? They left Jerusalem, they dispersed throughout Asia Minor, and Peter's writing to these people who are confused, who have lost their identity, who are wondering, who are we as God's people? We're we're not in our, our place We're feeling this pressure from the world all around us and and Peter's writing to encourage them to see the all-surpassing worth of the gospel and to, to encourage them to stand strong together, to keep growing together as a community of believers and to find comfort and confidence in who they are as God's people because it felt like the world was falling apart around them. So it's here in our text that that Peter writes to tell these struggling Christians that there's great hope for them, not out there, but in who they are as a community of God's people. I've structured today's sermon into four points. We're going to look at four realities of biblical community. We're going to see these four realities of biblical community are identity, worship, sanctification, which we'll define in a few moments, and mission. And it's really these four realities that build on themselves. Peter's building these things into this crescendo of who we are as a biblical community. So the first reality of biblical community is identity. Biblical community is based on our identity as God's people. Now, Peter's just gotten done earlier in chapter two, instructing the church that those who are coming against them, Those who are persecuting them as God's people are actually coming against Jesus himself. He says, what they're doing to you, they're actually doing to me. And then he transitions to this verse, verse nine, contrasting those that come against Jesus with those who follow Jesus. Look at nine. It says, but you, in contrast with those others who are coming against Jesus, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. First thing we need to see here in our text this morning, church, is it goes really for all four verses we're gonna be looking at. When Peter is saying you, he's using the second person plural. He's speaking to the church corporately. When Peter says you, what he's really saying is you all. If you're from Texas, here's your verse, y'all. Talking to y'all, the community of God's people. 
y'all, the church, you all are a chosen race. You all together are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. So what's that mean for us? It means that collectively as God's people in community, we have an identity. We have an identity. Windsor Community Church, we are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. And together we are God's possession. It's important for us for two reasons. See, first it's important because our identity is tied directly to one another. To who we are as a people corporately. And second, who we are as that people, as this community is is ultimately fulfilled and culminates in Jesus. Who Jesus is and what he's done for us is what binds us together as the identified people of God. Now, Peter makes these four statements about who we are as the community of God, and and all four should remind us of the people of God in the Old Testament. Right? As we read about who we are as God's people, Paul uses these four titles that God called the nation of Israel in the Old Covenant to be. Israel was to be the chosen race. They were the holy nation. They were the royal priesthood. They were God's own possession. And so what Peter's doing is he's uniting our story with theirs. He's painting this picture that our identity has been formed from the garden all the way until now. He's uniting us to the promises and hopes of God's people from Adam to Noah to Abraham, through King David and the prophets, we are a people that have been chosen, set apart, and made holy as God's own possession. This identity unites us to a story far bigger than ourselves. This identity catches catches us into the stream of God's people that have been happening since before time began. A story that's been written from eternity past. A story that begins in a garden that we see is disrupted by an enemy, but that continues to move forward through a gracious God meeting his people over and over again. And then we know this story has a very real hero, doesn't it? This hero, Jesus Christ, who would rescue and purchase that people. And one day this story will end in a garden again, free from sin, living out our identity in perfect, full, and final ways. To know who we are and to know we are meant to grow together, we must recognize our identity is tied to a people through the redemptive plan of God. And then the second reason this identity is important is it finds its fulfillment and culmination in Jesus. Where Israel failed to live out that identity, Jesus succeeded perfectly. Jesus is the true and better Israel. Through his perfect life and death on the cross, those who put their trust and faith in him as a community of people, we become this chosen race. Through Christ, we are a holy nation. We've been made a royal priesthood, and in Christ, we are God's own possession. Our identity rests wholly on who Jesus is and what he's done for us as his people. And so that, ma- that means that no matter what you were before you were in Christ, no matter what your identity was, now you're in Christ. Your identity is rooted in him. That's what's most true about you individually. Not what your identity was before, but who you are now in Christ, but it's also what's most true about us corporately. We are Christ's, and our identity as a people rests in him. By way of illustration, I want to share an experience I've had that that might help us understand this idea. In December of 2019, I realized I needed to, to focus on my physical health. I'd, I'd put it aside through school and, and ministry, and, and I knew my, my weaknesses and my failures well enough that 
I needed to set a really lofty goal to be successful, to, to keep me committed and on track. And so starting January 1st, I committed to run 1,000 miles in 2020. Now you're probably saying, I see you on crutches. I, <laughs> the doctor assured me that's not what happened, but maybe. Right, so I, I, I set out to do this. And for the first few months, it was really, really hard. Every morning I'd get up knowing I had to get my run in that day, right? You miss a day, there's more catching up to hit 1,000. And, and that run would fall down on the priority list of my day until it was almost bedtime and I hadn't got my run in. I gotta go do this, right? And, and I was running to, to try and lose some weight and get healthier, but, but the thing was when the byproduct of running, weight loss was my only goal, it was really difficult. It wasn't very motivating. In fact, it was quite a chore. Every run and every mile was really hard. But a few months into that journey, I listened to a running podcast. This person was talking about how you can grow as a runner and how you can be a more committed and better runner. And they said, if, if you really wanna grow in your running, you, you need to recognize you don't just run, but you're a runner. Like you have to have this identity shift. And for me, I was just running, miserably running. But I listened to this podcast, I knew kind of how identity works. I said, you know what, every day I'm gonna tell myself I'm a runner, I'm a runner. Even though I'm not a very good runner, I'm a runner. And so I started telling myself that every day and it took a while, but after a few months, I'd convinced myself I don't just run, I am now a runner. And over time I started to believe that and things began to shift. Running was no longer a chore. It was no longer something on my checklist that continued to fall down in, in the day. In fact, I actually started loving running. Amen. I looked forward <laughs> to running. I couldn't wait to get out there and get those miles in. I wasn't just running to simply lose weight now, I was running because I was a runner. Losing weight was just a, a good byproduct of what I was doing and who I was becoming. Here's the reality, friends. Who we are drives what we do, right? I want us to see, we don't do Christian community, we are Christian community. And because of that, we gather and we know each other and we grow together. We don't do community simply hoping to get something out of it. We are community. And naturally, what happens is the things the Bible says that are the beauties of being in community together start to flow out of who we are as that community. Right? There's certainly things we get out of being community together. There's joy in walking together. There's reminder of who we are in Christ. There's spurring on to good works. There's all these things. But if, if that's simply the motivation, when those things don't come as fast or as often as I want them to, I can bail. Rather than seeing my life with Christ as this individualistic endeavor, with myself at the center and community just being another thing I need to juggle, I wonder what it might look like if we recognize that our life with Christ has always meant to be communal and corporate. Friends, our life with Christ was never meant to be a solo mission. What would it be like if we had community at the center of who we were? Picture our life with Christ like a wheel. The hub of this wheel is no longer me as an individual, me and Jesus, but the hub of that wheel, the center of it, was who I am as part of this Christian community. And now all of the things I do in life, those plates I have to juggle, work, play, school, friendships, all those things are spokes that are derived from who I am as part of this Christian community. This might radically reorient our lives, but I wanna suggest it would change community from being something that is a chore to something that brings life and joy and beauty to our lives. It would become something that's woven into the fabric of, of who we are and what we do, not just another add-on to our already overly busy schedules and lifestyles. 
And I want to commend so many of you. So many of you do this really well. I see you inviting members of this community to your children's sporting events and to different uh, uh, places that you, you have to go and you're, you're known and you're being known. But what would it look like if, if we took another step of intentionality? That everything we do, everything we pursue, all of the plates we're juggling were viewed through this, this filter and this lens that we belong to one another. Community is not another thing we have to do, it's who we are. Now back to, to the running illustration, there were days, I'll be honest, even after I had that identity shift, I, I still wasn't always excited about getting in the miles and there's going to be days where this community is more difficult than other days to participate in. Right? There's gonna be days after a long, hard day of work and community group is coming, that it feels like a chore. Let's be honest. There's going to be times where coming to church on a Sunday morning and engaging with one another feels more like a burden than a blessing. Let's be honest. But when we recognize community is who we are, not just something we do, it helps us recognize that this community is a part of me, and I'm a part of it, and when I'm not there, the community is not all it's meant to be. And it's the same for every one of us. When Christian community is the hub of, of that wheel, I believe those days, they become fewer and fewer, but they still happen. And when they do come, as we recognize community is who we are, not what we do, we're motivated to engage because this community is at the core of our identity. This community needs me and I need it. It's who we are together. Our identity is communal. We are the chosen people of God. It's who we are, not just what we do. First reality of biblical community, it's our identity. Second, second reality is worship. A biblical community is a worshiping community. Look back at the text with me. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Tied to this community's identity is the act of worship. Peter says, you are these things so that you may proclaim the excellencies of of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, when we think of worship, a number of things probably come to mind, don't they? For most of us, when we hear worship, we probably think about some, some sort of singing, some sort of praise, and, and that's good and right. But what I believe Peter's getting at here is a, a more holistic view of worship, a, a whole life worship, if you will. No less than singing, but even more than singing. As we experience our identity as the people of God together, there's, there's two different ways we can think through how we worship as a community. The first way is what I'm gonna call direct worship. This is our response to such a rescue we read about in verses nine and 10. Once we were not a people, not a community, not near God, separated in our sin, but now we are a people. We are a community brought near to God through Jesus. Once we had not received mercy, and now through Jesus we have. And so the good and right response for this community that has been reconciled to both God and each other is to worship. It is to sing praises. It is to proclaim with our voices the excellencies of Jesus. And this wasn't a, a thought that only Peter had. If you read throughout the New Testament, all of the authors had this understanding of the biblical community being a worshiping community. Paul says this in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is the manifestation of direct worship among community. In response to who Jesus is for us and what he's done for us, we turn our affections and praise to him with thankfulness in our hearts. And so we worship together in community. And do you notice, as much as we experience worship 
as this, this personal, intimate engagement with God, Paul points to this corporate act of worshiping together in community, singing to each other, singing among each other as we worship and grow together. Friends, you know what we just did a few minutes ago was actually as much you singing to God as it was you singing to each other. Corporately lifting our voices in praise, hearing my brothers and sisters worship the God who rescued them does something to me, doesn't it? It does something to you. But also notice this direct worship is more than just singing, isn't it? As we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, as we teach and admonish one another, we're worshiping. That means as we gather here on a Sunday morning, greeting one another, praying together, singing together and to each other, hearing the word of God preached, taking the Lord's Supper, celebrating baptisms, the entire gathering from the moment you walk into the door until you leave is a worship service. And we do these things in community together in response to who Jesus is and what he's done for us. This is our direct worship as a community. But there's also an indirect aspect of worship that I believe Peter and Paul are both going, pointing to. Right? There's this holistic view of worship for the community of God's people. Look, look at or listen to Colossians 3.17, the verse right after the one we just read. Here's what Paul continues to say. Whatever you do, what is that? Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do in word or deed, spoken in action, do in the name of Jesus. That's, that's worship, friends. What Paul is saying is there's a way that our whole lives, especially in community, can be this indirect act of worship now. This indirect act. It may not be singing may not be directly offering our praise and adoration to God, but there is this sense that we can live in such a way that everything we do as a community proclaims the excellencies of Jesus. And if you're newer to Windsor Community Church, I want to let you know that a natural rhythm for us to practice this indirect worship is through our community groups. These are, are groups of people who live out our identity we've talked about they seek to, to worship together both directly and indirectly as they share meals. They gather around the word and they encourage each other with the gospel. They live life together and they build deep relationships, growing together in how they know God through the gospel. And community groups are, are such a meaningful part of who we are as a community that if you're not involved in one, I would give you a strong encouragement with a big smile on my face. We're not legalistic about it, but a strong encouragement to get plugged into one. And if you're not, and you're interested, there's a connect card in the seat back in front of you. Put your name on the inside, on the back, on the notes section, right? Help me get plugged into a community group. Leave that at the connect desk after church today, and we'll follow up with you, and we'll help you get connected to a community group. We believe that this is a meaningful way for us to be community here at Windsor Community Church. This holistic view of worship, one that includes both direct and indirect worship, rightly presses against both sides of what we see to be a temptation in the American church today. Hear me on this. One side, we have this temptation to make everything we do about Sunday morning. Right? We want great worship, and we want great preaching, and we want great fellowship, and those are good things, but our view of community stops there. And the danger of this view is it shrinks this community and its worship down to something we do one day a week within the four walls of this building. Do you see the danger there? Right? This tendency, it also creates this consumer mentality in us that might be under the surface, I don't, I don't think anyone's going around saying these things, but this, this tendency can create this consumer mentality and it's, it's dangerous because what happens is if, if certain things start to change in the Sunday gathering, all of a sudden one aspect of community is not meeting what I really want, I can start to get restless and I can start looking for it to, to be met somewhere else, right? 
I don't remember where this quote, quote comes from. I read it at some point. It's not mine. It says, for many, the reason you went to your church will end up being the reason you leave your church. Think about that. I think it's a, a, a really helpful quote to consider. Right? If the only reason you're at this church is because of a particular preacher or because you think Chase is the best worship leader you've ever heard, or you love the aesthetic of this building, or how we do children's church, or a program that we have, when one of those things change, and the reality is they probably will at some point, you leave. But if this community is what draws you, if our shared identity in Christ is what connects you to this church. We can appreciate those things. We can even love those things. But it's our identity as a community that draws us and keeps us as a part of this body. And so this holistic view of worship and community, it, it keeps us from being tempted to see community being wrapped up in this building one day a week, right? It keeps us from being consumers. But this holistic view of worship and community presses against the other side too. Right? This, this other side that tempts us to think that if we have community outside of the Sunday gathering and we have a, a good Bible study, we go to Bible study fellowship, we have Christian friends, we have great worship sessions in our car on the way to work, then what we need is being met by those things and the gathering of God's people and the direct worship of the Sunday gathering loses its place of priority. And what happens is we start to walk in the warnings of the author of Hebrews. It says, do not forsake gathering together. And all those things are good that I just mentioned. But the temptation can be to, to make, make those top. And we, we, can, we can forsake the gathering. And so let me just say, the beauty of biblical community, as we've been talking about this morning, is that it draws us into a holistic, balanced, healthy place of worship together. Knowing God through the gospel, protects us from being consumers on one side, from being disengaged from the local gathering on the other. So worshiping together directly and indirectly in community is who we are, not what we do. This community at Windsor Community Church is so much more than the preaching ministry, so much more than the worship that you hear up here. It's so much more than the, the programs we offer and the classes that we have. We are a people reconciled to God reconciled to each other, proclaiming King Jesus through the ways we live together and love one another, worshiping both directly and indirectly. It's who we are, not what we do. Third reality. Third reality is sanctification. It's growing together corporately in this biblical community. Look down with me at verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. So far as we've read this passage, we've recognized the, the plural you, right? This y'all. Paul's been saying y'all are this chosen race, this holy nation. But we get to, to verse 11, we have this tendency to, to go back to the, the singular you. And this, this fight I have against sin, this pursuit of sanctification, which simply means cooperating with God's grace to be more like Jesus, to grow in my faith, to be who I already am in the gospel. That's what sanctification means. We think of it as this individual act. For some reason, we have this view that the way we grow in knowing God through the gospel, the way Peter calls it, fighting or warring against sin, these things are a private battle. It's a, way, a war I wage on my own like a lone mercenary behind enemy lines. But what Peter's saying in verse 11 is, that's just not true. This is still a communal corporate verse. Now, he does say that we're in a war, doesn't he? Passions of the flesh, our old sin nature, wage a war against our souls. But let me ask you a question. Who fights wars? Armies do. Armies fight wars. Peter's calling us to engage this battle against sin together as an army that is the community of God. None of us would want to take on Hamas alone, would we? Nor should any of us want to war against our sin privately, individually, alone. Sanctification is this community 
calling each other and pulling each other and building each other up to be who we already are in Jesus. We're this royal priesthood. And we wage a war against sin by reminding each other of that, by praying together. When we have a, a, an identity crisis and we're going down a path of sin, the brothers and sisters in this community remind us that you're forgiven and you're redeemed and you're a son or daughter of God. Walk in that which you already are. Everything about us as Christians hinges on the shared identity we have in Jesus together. So the way we wage war against the passions of our flesh is together, reminding one another, praying for one another, calling one another to see that we already are all of these things in Jesus. Friends, sanctification is a group project. Growing together in our faith is a group project. Let's not be that student who never shows up for the group project and everyone has to do all the work, right? We know that person. Throughout the New Testament, as the biblical authors are writing to these different Christian communities to encourage and instruct, and they're continually using corporate language to edify the followers of Jesus. Every book in the New Testament recognizes that sanctification is a group project. One phrase that's used over and over and over again in the New Testament reminding God's people to be and do things for one another is the one another statements. You've probably heard those. Roughly 59 of these statements, depending on your English translation, teach us how or how not to relate to one another in community. And so many of them address this corporate view of fighting sin and growing in our faith together. Listen to just a few. Encourage and build one another up, 1 Thessalonians 5. Speak truth to one another, Ephesians 4. Colossians 3, bear with and forgive one another. Ephesians 5, be subject to one another. James 5, confess your sins to one another. Here's what's striking about these and all the other one another statements. They can't be done alone, can they? Right, if I'm not in community, how do I bear with and forgive someone? Who do I encourage if I'm by myself? Who am I subject to on my own? And these one another's weren't just this good idea that the biblical authors had, like, hey, let's throw in some of these to encourage the, the people of God, right? The, these one another's were God's way of reminding us that, that woven into the fabric of how we grow and how we become more like Christ in Christian community is being known in community, is being honest with one another, is forgiving one another and putting on display all that Christ is for us, for each other. And that's scary, isn't it? We talked about it last week. This is a, this is a scary proposition. See, the reality is if this community is ever going to really wage a war against sin, if we're ever really going to encourage one another to be all that we already are in Jesus, real, vulnerable, transparent relationships must occur. And without a gospel-centered culture, I'm just going to be honest with you, that's dangerous. It's not just scary, it's dangerous. Like, that's a right fear we should have if we don't let the gospel permeate everything we do here. So it's exactly why we talked about last week, the gospel and being gospel-centered drives everything that we do here as a church. And so if you weren't with us last week, if, if you missed last week's sermon, I encourage you to go listen to it because it is foundational for the way we want to relate to one another how we want to know God together, that the gospel is so important to us because it allows this community to be vulnerable, transparent, and safe, right? When the gospel is the foundation of everything we do and it's the basis of everything we believe, our community should become a safe place. In fact, one pastor I, I love and respect so much, his name's Ray Ortland says that community that helps people grow and transform and fight sin is marked by three things, gospel, safety, and time. Here's what he says about gospel. Gospel is good news for bad people through the finished work of Christ on the cross and the endless power of the Holy Spirit. Multiple exposures, constant immersion, wave upon wave of grace and truth according to the Bible. He says the, the community that, that grows together is also marked by safety, right? This non-accusing environment, 
No embarrassing anyone. No manipulation, no oppression, no condescension, but respect and sympathy and understanding. I love this. Where sinners can confess and unburden their souls. Isn't that like a breath of fresh air? A church environment where no one seeking the Lord has anything to fear. And then finally time, no pressure. Not even self-imposed pressure. No deadlines on growth, urgency but not hurry because no one changes quickly. A lot of space for complicated people to rethink their lives at a deep level. God is patient and so we will be too. Gospel, safety, and time. This is what we strive for our community to be, gentle environments where people can be real and honest. Where they don't have to, to build walls or wear masks where we can be honest and we know we'll be met with the safety of the gospel. We're encouraged to see the truth. They remind us of what's true about God and about us. We extend grace to one another. We pray for each other. We point each other back to Jesus and then we're patient with one another because we understand growing together in our faith, sanctification takes time. And so through the gospel and safety, we walk together and we walk together and we walk together toward Jesus fighting sin, helping each other up when we fall, rallying together as an army, proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus together. This is the type of community I so want us to be marked by. Gospel, safety, and time. I know that's the type of church community I want to be a part of. How about you? Like, does that sound attractive, right? So far, we've seen the biblical community is made up of identity, worship and sanctification. Finally, I want to see that the last reality of this community that God created us to be is missional. The reality of this community is that it desires for others to know Jesus. Look at verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Part of the gracious gift of God to his people and community is an outward facing others focus missional life. And we see it in this text and it's an integral part of who we are as God's people throughout the New Testament. But I'm gonna leave that for next week. I'm leaving you with a cliffhanger. This is the Netflix series to be continued. We're getting into mission next week and we're gonna dive deep into what it means to go together to places we live, work, learn, and play. So you gotta come back. Friends, our desire as a church is to be devoted to knowing God through the gospel, growing together in our faith together as the identified people of Christ. So I hope this morning we've seen that the realities of biblical community are meant to cause us to grow together into who we already are in our shared identity through corporate worship, communal sanctification, and collective mission. May we know this community is who we are, not what we do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that through Jesus, you've rescued us from our sin. And that's such great news. And yet the news gets even better when we realize you don't rescue us and leave us. You don't pull us from behind enemy lines and say, okay, good luck, fight the war on your own. But you place us in a community. You bring us among other people that share the identity that we have and you give us hope and strength and motivation to be who we already are together in this community. And so would you, would you use this reality of biblical community in our lives to shape us and to make us who, who you want us to be? In Jesus' name, amen.